If you have your Bible with you, we ask that you would turn with us to the 28th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. This is probably the most familiar, most widely read whenever that it comes to speaking about the resurrection of Christ or anything about the life of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, a lot of people will look at this and they'll say, well, Luke said this and John said that and Mark said this. And therefore, there's discrepancies there. Well, actually, Christ Jesus was the center of their writing. And he may look at that individual from the right side. I guess it would be your left from the left side. And he would describe him in this way. And they would look at him from the right side or from the back side or from the front. Now, there's no discrepancy in the word of God. Amen. It is not not full of errors. And I find today that if they had just carbon copied the message, then the critics would have come out of the woodwork saying, see, you know, they just all copied off of each other. But today we want to look at Matthew's gospel and look at the first verse. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and just sat on it. His countenance was like lightning his raiment as white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers, that is the guards that were there, did shake and became as dead men. It didn't say that they died, but they became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye. I say to the people that are here today, Fear not. Yeah. Christ has conquered death. You're not going to find him in a tomb. Fear not ye, for I know whom seek ye, Jesus, which, or in other words, who was crucified. For he is not here, for he is risen. And as he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. We're going to stop there for just a moment. We may go down further into that chapter, but we'd like to take for a verse text, if you will, the sixth verse, where that it says, He's not here, for He is risen. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And that's what we'd like to do for just a moment is just peek inside of the tomb. Maybe we'll not be able to describe it the way that it was that day, whenever that they came to embalm him, to wrap more wrappings around him. But I hope today that maybe we'll be able to see the reality of it much more. Because there's some of these verses of Scripture that I never really had noticed before or never really caught my attention. Last night we talked about how that he said, it is finished. The plan of redemption has been completed. Righteousness has been perfected. Not our righteousness because we have none but the righteousness which is of Jesus Christ. That's how God looks at us today. Justice was satisfied. What he did upon the cross satisfied the justice of God. Blood was shed. Without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. Sin is forgiven. Reconciliation was achieved. Christ Jesus brought man and brought God together at the cross. And so salvation was secured there. But for us today, one of the most important things is that death was conquered. O oh, grave, where is thy victory? O oh, death, where is thy sting? Now that morning, 
was quite a morning. You know, I, I think a parallel of it, of how when the angel came and announced and threw the stone back and, and all of these things, that there was something exciting and something marvelous and miraculous that was taking place in the tomb. And about 33 years earlier, to a little virgin lady by the name of Mary, something miraculous happened in her womb. And both of them brought forth the Son of God who was going to fulfill all righteousness, fulfill the law, who was going to take our sins upon himself. And he was going to die the death that you and I deserve. But yet he was going to conquer death. That was the marvelous story about it, aspect of it. We don't serve a dead Savior today. If he just died and his bones were somewhere else, in case probably in a church over in that country, we would just be serving a martyr. We would just be serving a cause. Just be serving a philosophy. But thanks unto God today that we are serving a risen Savior. And can you imagine today, just think with me for a moment, can you imagine today what that was like whenever that the angel descended? They had placed a huge stone over the mouth of the grave or the tomb that had been given for this very purpose by Joseph of Arimathea, a, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself a Pharisee, but he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he offered his new tomb. Nobody else had been laid in that tomb. It was a new tomb. There was no ossuary box inside of it. He didn't have relatives buried in it, but it was a new tomb. But they had placed Jesus wrapped in linen with spices to preserve him for a few days till they could come again. And the stone was rolled over the front of it. Now, I'm not going to. There's no illustrations that I can use to try to narrow this down. But it was a, kind of like a cylinder, only, you know, smaller. And some estimates about the weight of it, because of the size of it, that it must have been close to a ton. That's what some people have estimated. Some have said it was even smaller than that. But it took more than just one or two or three to roll that stone to the fa over the face of the tomb of Jesus. Also, they placed a guard, a quatrain of, of probably Roman and temple guards. They estimate that there was about 16 of them. The reason why that they did it, because when they guard anything, they do it in shifts. So many soldiers would guard the front of it or whatever they were assigned to. The others slept. And then they would change shifts. It's like they were working a shift. And then after that, they placed some seal, a seal of, of ropes over the front of it and placed upon it the seal of the Roman Empire encased in clay. With this understanding, anyone who breaks this seal is guilty, guilty and in big trouble for breaking that seal. And so Jesus was uh, encased in this and was probably uh, there uh, not very many hours, not very many days. We're told that it was three days. Well, we find that the Bible tells us that, he, that these guards that were there were at the request of the Pharisees and the chief priests. They'd gone to Pilate. And they, they had said, you know, that deceiver said that in three days he will arise from the dead. Now think about it. They didn't believe in him, but yet, you know, there's just that possibility. He might try to come out of that grave. So let's have a guard that's there. And, and let them guard the tomb. And let them, let them seal over the stone. 
And, you know, they did all of this trying to prevent or trying to uh, stop as much as possible. Lest his disciples should come and steal him away. Now, think with me for just a moment. Where were the disciples? They were hiding. And knowing how he was buried and knowing how they had been sealed over, who in their right mind would try to go and steal the body of Christ and perpetuate a fable. Because even if they got past the sleeping guards and the guards that might have been on each side of it, there was still the problem of rolling the stone, breaking the seal. And they felt like that they were in enough trouble as it was because that they had followed him. They were so afraid that he was going to come forth from the grave that they were willing to do everything possible to prevent it. They'd taken all the measures. They'd taken all the precautions. But there's one thing, I shouldn't say thing, but there's one person they didn't take into consideration in all of this, and that was the Lord God because he had set this all in motion. This is where the, the steps, we've been preaching about the pathway under the cross, and here's where the steps are going to end, in a sense. They're not going to go to a cross again, but they're going to ascend and represent us before Almighty God. We find today that he kept perfectly the law, and that's how we keep the law, because if we're in Christ Jesus, everything that he has done, his righteousness, his, his obedience unto God, what we could not do, what Adam did not do, he has done for us. And we stand justified before Almighty God. So there was an earthquake right on time. You know, God does things on time. Do you know God does things perfectly? We may not understand them at the time. We may not know. You know, we, we look at our, in this microwave generation, we look at our watches and we look at the calendar. And yes, I know that we've got some food waiting there. <laughs> but nevertheless, I want you to know we live in a microwave generation. And we want it, Lord. Now. Now. And you know, we can look back at Abraham, how that he waited so long for the birth of a child, of, a, of an heir, and how long that took. And whenever that, that was about to be filled, fulfilled, Abraham kind of laughed about it, and so did Sarah. But God is always on time, because we find in the scriptures, in the book of the Galatian letter, that when the fullness of the time, notice he says, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those that were under the law, that we might have and be the righteousness of Christ. So at the right time, at the appointed time, the third day, it was the third day. And you know, probably there were anxious Pharisees and chief priests back in, the, uh, back in the city of Jerusalem saying to themselves, see, he wasn't who he said he was. See, there's no report about him. But you know, the angel of God descended upon that tomb. And you know, the seal of Rome didn't make any difference to God because he's sovereign God over everything. We said the other night, whenever that the Lord comes back, he's going to do two things. He's going to straighten out everybody's politics and he's going to straighten out everybody's theology. And so he descended upon that. The angel did. And I want you to know that seal didn't mean anything to that angel. He just broke the seal of Caesar, of Augustus. 
He took the stone, and I've heard some say that he just kind of flung it over to the side. I don't know. Maybe he rolled it up the incline. But nevertheless, the stone was removed. And Christ Jesus came forth out of that tomb, triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. You know, that whenever that those keepers saw this take place, it gripped them so that they shook with fear. It was Almighty God demonstrating His power. It was Almighty God showing that He had all things under control, that the way into the holiest of all, not in Jerusalem, but into heaven itself, had been opened up, and now man could come unto God through the veil of his flesh, through him. We find over in one place, and I kind of go back to the crucifixion for just a moment, but whenever that he died and he said it's finished, do you know that the veil rent in twain in Jerusalem? It split not like that. It split like that. Both inner and outer veil. They said that it was 60 feet in height over the Holy of Holies. No one was to go in there. No one was to approach it. But God opened it up whenever the Christ finished his work and said, it's finished. And you know, we talked last night about, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, it'll be on the internet. But as we said last night, one of the first people into heaven itself was a thief. A thief. But then we find, and I'm kind of going back and forth, just bear with me. When that opened up unto mankind, God, God could receive sinners. God could receive men coming through Christ Jesus. There was a centurion that heard what he said as he died upon the cross, and he said, surely, surely this was the Son of God. I'm kind of persuaded to believe that he had already entered into that veil. I think in some way, and I don't have much proof of it, but I've got a feeling a man that had worshipped Zeus and Jupiter and Mercury and all the gods of the Romans, Acknowledge the one true God and His Son. And so I believe with all of my heart, I'll see that centurion someday. I'm going to see that, that thief someday. But we're not going to be recognized as thieves or as sinners or whatever. We're going to be recognized as children of God. And we're going to be singing a very special song that not even the angels can sing. And that's the song of the redeemed. And you know, just as this choir and all of you singing is glorious, can you imagine when we all get together? And whenever we begin to sing that song, you'll be the angels, the angels over here just kind of wonder what they're talking about. But that's not to put us on a pedestal or anything. We come there by God's grace. We are sinners by nature. And we are also uh, saints of God. So today I'm very thankful for this day. And I'm very thankful for what God has done. And oh yes, I'm not going to leave Jesus in the grave. I, sometimes when I preach, I leave him on the cross. And, and people will ask me later, uh, weren't you going to finish that up a little bit? I'll try to finish this up. He came forth. And he was not like Lazarus who was brought back from the dead in grave clothes. Think about that for just a moment. For whenever that Peter looked in, whenever that Peter and John went to the grave, do you know what they found? They just found where the Lord lay and the evidence of it, where that there was linen cloth set to the side and the head napkin that was placed over his head over here. He had come through that. Think about the power that was in that. He had conquered death. 
He had conquered all of those things for us. And I want to tell you, being in Christ Jesus, death will not have any hold on us. Oh, yes, I know we'll probably at some point maybe go six feet under the ground. But, you know, if he could break the seal of Rome and roll that stone up an incline, do you know he could break open a vault and call you out? There's nothing impossible with God. If he was able to save us, if he was able to make a plan of salvation that included all of us, surely undoubtedly, We'll experience that great resurrection. And you know, I, you can ask my wife that a lot of times my prayer is often like this. Oh, Lord, let me just live long enough that I can see you coming. And that may never happen. But I know one day I'm going to see him. And I know one day you're going to see him. And I know one day we're going to see the saints of God We'll all sit down with Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. And we're going to understand each other. We won't have to take a Rosetta Stone course to be able to understand ancient Hebrew. We'll know as we are known. We'll rejoice. And there will even be work in heaven. We'll be working for the Lord. And someone will say, oh, don't tell me that. I just retired. I understand. But it'll be a heavenly work. We're not going to just float around on clouds and twang a harp, but we'll be rejoicing and working and rejoicing and working and rejoicing and working and basking in the love of God. And forevermore, we're going to be reminded of how that we got there and who paid the price. Because you see, there'll be, a, there'll be some man-made things in heaven. Yeah. <clears throat> His hands that were pierced was something like this. His feet that were pierced, his side that was riven, we'll be reminded of it. Not that we're going to forget it, but I'll tell you this much. We'll know how we got there. We'll know when we get there, and we'll know who made it possible. God bless your prayer. We're going to go eat. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.